Hello, it's Wesley with 22 Zines, and this is the next episode of Zine Collector. Uh, it's a little bit of a different format because this is sort of a special collection for me. It is my collection of Peculiar Parish publications, um, which are most famous for creating Fiddler's Green, Peculiar Parish magazine. What I've decided to do for this episode, since these are all from the same place, is rather than describing the zine itself and talking about the publisher a lot, I am actually just going to read a few little snippets from each of these zines and maybe talk a little bit about why I like it um, to hopefully give you more of a taste of what sort of things that Peculiar Parish puts out and just the writing style and I think it'll be really fun. Uh, it gives me a good excuse to go back over all of these lovely zines that I've read many times before and pick out some of my favorite parts. The publication I'm going to start with is the premiere issue of Tales from Fiddler's Green, and this is a brand new, as in I think it was released in March of this year, 2021. It is a brand new uh, publication that Peculiar Parish is putting out featuring fiction stories where mostly uh, Fiddler's Green and their other zines are um, not fictional, but biographical or informational in some way. And this is a feature of prose. Here, I'll just read this. Prose and verse for tea-drinking anarchists, convival conjurers, and closeted optimists. Um, and I've really enjoyed it. I love all the stories in it. Here's what it looks like on the inside. Because this is so no so new, you can still get it from their website. Unfortunately, a lot of the things I'm going to be showing off are out of print, but um, some of them aren't. <laughs> I really love <laughs> I love reading it. One thing about all of Peculiar Parish is just the production quality is so beautiful and smooth, and um, they have these amazing linen covers. I'm not going to talk too much about this. Um, the Part of this that I'm going to be reading is just the introduction. It is, and I'm going to go ahead and read this whole introduction because I feel like it serves as a good introduction for everything that is published by Peculiar, uh, Peculiar Parish. So I just feel like it'll set the mood. The title of the introduction here is The Transformative Power of Stories, and it was written by Susan, Susan Reddington Bobby. One of my happiest childhood memories was taking a trip to the Watt and Shand department store in downtown Lancaster, Pennsylvania. I remember that my mother parked a few stories up, and we rode the elevator down to the open-air walkway, bridging the cool, dark, gasoline-infused scent of the garage to the old building housing the store, founded in 1878. I would touch the railing tentatively and peer over at cars passing in the alley below, pull back, frightened, then scurry to the doorway that opened into what looked like the back stairwell of an office building. Down the scuffed stairs, past the green walls, this nondescript tunnel opened into the most glorious world, a back entrance to the department store's array of books. I remember brown bookshelves lining the walls, and in the back corner, children's and adolescent literature. Here I would sit on the floor, leaning against the shelves, scanning the spines, until I found a treasure to take home. Here was the collection of Laura Ingalls Wilder's Little House on the Prairie books, the Anne of Green Gables series, and, when I was a teen, the Wildfire romances. I remember saving my allowance or birthday money for books, although I knew if there was something I really, really wanted, my mother would help out, because a teacher would never deprive her book-loving daughter of enough to read. Books followed me everywhere I went. I received them for birthday and Christmas presents, I bought them at Scholastic Book Fairs, and my mother took me to the Lancaster Public Library as often as I wanted. When I started sleeping on the top bunk, my dad installed metal shelves just a foot or so down from the ceiling so I could keep my books close. As I grew older, I remember fondly packing for family vacations in Ocean City, Maryland. Everyone else was concerned with packing bathing suits and rafts, but I would spend hours making a list of books to read and fill half my suitcase with them, for vacation to me meant reading, 
the same thing I did at home, but in another location. Later in life, I decided to major in English, and eventually I became an English professor, so one could say I've spent both my life and career immersed in books. But it was only in the past several years that I began to write stories in earnest, and that opened up an entirely new world to me. Every writer was once, or still is, an avid reader. The two pastimes go hand in hand. I suspect that much of what I've just shared with you rings true for many, if not all of us, who read Fiddler's Green Peculiar Parish magazine. When I first came across this magical zine, it was the cover that enchanted and transported me back in time to the days I spent as a child connected to the transformative power of stories. When I received my first copy in the mail, I was further elated. The hand-addressed envelope and note from Clint, the array of colorful stamps, the quality of the paper, the embossed cover, all of it sent me back to the way I felt as a child opening up a delightful series book or a beautiful hardbound book of fairy tales. And when I began to read, I was transported yet again to another time, to another place. It was pure magic. This is what I hope each and every one of you feels when you read Tales from Fiddler's Green, the series' first ever all-story issue. I am humbled and honored to have selected for you a gathering of tales that will delight and intrigue you. Here are stories that will make you laugh and smile. Here are stories that will make you think. Here are stories that might even make you cry. Most of all, though, I hope that when you hold this collection in your hands, reading these beautifully worded passages, your eyes dancing over the gorgeous illustrations, you will catch a glimpse of how you felt in your special place as a little one, immersed in the act of reading for pleasure. All of our writers are skilled artisans of the craft. I hope their work transports you to another time and place, a world that is called Fiddler's Green. One thing that's really nice about Fiddler's Green um, is that recently they've started including these little uh, records. I don't know exactly what these are called, and unfortunately I don't have any way to actually play this. But if you have some sort of uh, record player or know what this is, um, they have additional uh, fables and readings that go... That they that they issue along with the zines. Um, this here is uh, Elfrida Fawn Fables, uh, issued free with Tales from Fiddler's Green One. So <laughs> it's um, <laughs> it's really interesting. I'd love to be able to listen to it someday. <laughs> the next publication that I have to show off is um, the first issue of Fiddler's Green that I ever got. This is issue three, I believe, of seven. I think now. Um, and this is titled Gardner's Giantess, and I first got this in a pagan witchcraft store in Denver, I think. Um, this is not the first publication that I ever got, but this is the full, full Fiddler's Green that I ever got, and it is, <laughs> and it is really beautiful and just definitely started my love affair with Fiddler's Green here. Um, two of these have actually been reprinted and reissued as these little mini zine or mini pamphlets, two of the articles that is. Um, one is Practical Bibliomancy for the Young and Old, um, and the other is Meeting the Sphinx on the Artist's Path, and I have both of those also, um, <laughs> just because I like them so much, but the, the uh, mini zines are usually almost always available through their website still. Look at this. Um, it's got this little fold-out thing. I love little fold-outs and stuff like that. Um, and I'm just gonna read real quick um, this, which is at the beginning of every Fiddler's Green, as far as I know. The Dream of Fiddler's Green. Fiddler's Green Peculiar Parish Magazine was born of a languid afternoon of conversation on a sunny tavern lawn. Taking its name from the pleasant afterlife dreamed into being by sailors, cavalrymen, and other adventurous spirits, Fiddler's Green gathers friends, good cheer, and a bit of magic to create a better world, not someday, but now. In ecclesiastical terms, the word peculiar refers to a district outside the jurisdiction of the church. It's also a good word for describing my own view of, rea my own view of reality, and likely yours as well. And so here is a peculiar parish magazine for anyone who doesn't feel the need to have their inner life dictated by others. 
If it is peculiar that we wish to govern our bodies and souls ourselves, then let us be peculiar. We make the dream real. The conversation continues, and there is room for you in it. Each of us is on our own journey, both in this world and whatever lies beyond it. Sometimes the path is well lit, at other times it is obscured. Your wanderings have brought you here, and I hope you'll stray for a while with me and the other souls gathered at Fiddler's Green. Clint Marsh. Clint Marsh is the creator and primary author, although these are um, compilations of multiple authors. It is such a pleasure to read um, <laughs> this Our Bogies, Our Shelves, that is the, the, uh, practical bibliomancy, uh, article. Anti-nightmare wallpaper and the ladies behind it. I think this is the one that I'm going to read a little bit of. Um, this one is, is beautiful. Landscapes of the Imagination, How Our Minds Model the Natural World, and it gives you little descriptions, old term worlds for referring to lands, landscapes, such as uh, Coom, a little valley often wooded with no river. Um, Dingle, <laughs> a deep wooded valley. <laughs> My two years old, I don't care. <laughs> I just think that's so funny. So it's really beautiful. And even the advertisements <laughs> are, are beautiful. And there, there aren't advertisements exactly. It's, you know, it's advertisements, but it's for very like-minded places, so, um, and it's, it's just integrated so well. Anyway, all right, what I want to show off from this issue is the Wild Unknown Tarot Guidebook, which I think is funny, and you'll probably recognize this Daughter of Swords from the Wild Unknown Tarot, uh, even if you don't have it. I feel like it's popular, well-known enough that you probably recognize it. Um, they have this section in the back where they are highlighting and uh, reviewing, I wouldn't say exactly reviewing, but highlighting different publications that were sent to them. And I just think it's so funny that the, the guidebook for the Wild Unknown Tarot uh, was mailed to them, and they, and they describe it here. Her cards employ several appealing innovations, among them the inclusion of wilderness and animal imagery instead of scenes of human life, and a replacement of the royal procession of page, knight, king, and queen with the more familiar daughter, son, mother, and father. In an opening essay, Kranz discusses the clarity and assuredness she receives from the act of drawing, wishing these same gifts for anyone who uses her tarot. Um, <laughs> and so I just, I just think that's really funny because I actually had Fiddler's Green long before I was uh, interested in tarot at all, or, you know, involved in it. And, and here it is, just a cute little synchronicity, I suppose. Okay, so the article that I want to show off from this, and I am not going to read the entire thing of most of these articles, um, but just a little bit to give you uh, some flavor, is Anti-Nightmare Wallpaper and the Ladies Behind It, <laughs> which, if that doesn't catch your attention, then I don't know what will. In the sleepy hamlet of Porta Costa, California, overlooking the quietly lapping waters of the Carquinez Strait, stands the time-worn Hotel Burlington. Erected in 1883 at the peak of the port's now-vanished wheat trade, the hotel's yellow-painted clapboard walls reach some 30 feet towards the heavens. Victorian-era ghosts are said to haunt the hallways, and clouds of bats emerge at dusk to hunt in the surrounding hills. The vibrant, velvet-flocked wallpaper lining the Burlington staircases seems robust enough to hold the entire building together. But this isn't necessary, for more than by wood, paint, or plaster, the hotel is sustained by stories of the past. Late last year, another layer was added to the Burlington's palimpsestic mystery, as one night in October it played host to an astonishing spectacle. Portraits and artifacts evincing an obscure coterie, the 1917 chapter of the secret society known as the Ladies of Happenstance, manifested upon the hotel's walls. Inscribed beneath each member's picture were an alias and a title, which were in turn corresponded to one of the 19 rooms at the Burlington. Partially disintegrated banners adorned the halls, and ceremonial vestments and magical tools appeared beneath the domes of glass. Rumors flew. Did the ladies of happenstance hold their meetings at the hotel nearly a century ago? Were they truly possessed of the subtle and eerie powers they claimed? And could the revelation of these objects presage a revival of this enigmatic order? A deeper look into the unsettling events of 1917, including those of the First World War and the Russian Revolution, 
helps to explain the origin of a society created to promote the calming of fears, the connection of gentle souls, and the conviction that kind and positive collective thought might benefit a world weary of turmoil and conflict. This was an era of increasing belief in visitations from other realms, from communion with the spirits of the departed to sightings of fairies at the bottom of the garden. Each supposed glimpse through the veil helped to strengthen faith in unseen powers. Even though the troubles of the world may have driven loved ones far apart, certain objects and rituals might be employed to project much-needed care and protection. The ladies of happenstance achieved their ends, as was common among the secret societies existing before them, through symbolism, ancient lore, and belief in the recondite. Latin mottos embellished inscrutable drawings, ceremonial garments were worn, and embroidered banners transmitted encoded knowledge to the initiated. Across the panoply of the society's emblems, one might find imagery as diverse as the golden triangles, representations of moths, silhouettes of hands, and uncanny pictures of young girls emanating skyward energy. Each lady was given an official title according to her specific gifts and the tasks she performed, from the radiant mistress of heliography to the dispeller of, of miasmic vapors. All members worked together to create a sense of calm spiritual strength with which they infused the world. So that's just one piece of this particular issue that I love very much. The next one that I want to show off is The Riddle of the Sphinx, The Artist's Path, and The Secrets of Immortality. This was one of the booklets that was published originally in Gardner's Giantess, or issue three, um, and that was remade into a uh, leaflet, is what they call it. Um, it is really beautiful. It basically talks about the um, the Sphinx and its connections with the artist's quest for immortality. <laughs> um, and it, it's, it's just as intriguing as it sounds. Um, and this, this will be a little portion that I will read from the section to stave off mortality. My apologies if I pronounce anything wrong, by the way. <laughs> Maybe I should have said that earlier. In his foundational book of occult philosophy, Transcendental Magic, Eliphas Levi considers the answers to the Sphinx riddle to be both literal and metaphoric, and applicable to mankind's spiritual development as well, saying, Infant humanity walks on four legs, evolving humanity on two legs, and to the power of his own mind, the redeemed and illuminated magus adds the staff of wisdom. The Sphinx is therefore the mystery of nature, the embodiment of the secret doctrine, and all who cannot solve her riddle perish. To pass the Sphinx is to attain personal immortality. Levi's claim is a bold one, to be sure, but it resonated with my musings on the Sphinx connection to inner life. I don't hold out hope for attaining physical immortality in this life, nor do I think I'd enjoy it. There are parts of ourselves we can cultivate that carry on past our earthly existences, though. Our children, our finances, the results of our careers, and the memories we leave our loved ones are all examples of this. For the ambitiously creative among us, though, deathlessness is largely attained through our completed works of art, a process that takes artist and artwork alike through a four-, two-, and three-legged progression, one watched over by the harshest, most bloodthirsty critic ever known. Whether the Sphinx is seen as a metaphor for society, the artist's self-doubt, or the creative process itself, if there is to be art, immortality attained then the monster must be defeated and toppled from its perch. And it goes on. <laughs> really lovely. The next one I have to share is Our Bogies, Our Shelves, The Magician's Library as Mentor, Companion, and Oracle. This, again, was also printed originally in Fiddler's Green 3. And this is a very beautiful little leaflet, little zine, that really captures why you might collect books, or tarot cards, or zines, or anything, even if you've gotten past the point of rereading them, because simply their presence is a testament to who you were at that time, and a memory of who you were at that time, and just, I'm not going to be able to do it justice. This is the way that this was is written is absolutely beautiful, and I connect with it very strongly. I think that um, if you are into tarot, as I'm sure many of you who follow me are, 
then if there's any one of these zines that I recommend that you pick up, it's this one. Because you could just as easily say about tarot decks and tarot cards all the things that this says about books. Um, and I think especially if you have a tendency to feel guilty about collecting tarot decks or having multiple tarot decks, then um, this might help you reframe your thinking of seeing them as a sort of extension of yourself. Anyway, so I'm going to go ahead and read a portion of this. Book learning took a backseat to practical experience in college. I moved to Iowa City to go to journalism school and much preferred interviewing and writing to my dry theory classes. I wrote for the university paper, edited the music section in the local weekly, and published my own zines. The promise of a greater glamour and glory had a hold on me, so at age 21 I packed it in for California, the most fabled land I could imagine. Even on this real-life adventure, books were my constant companions. My rough guide to San Francisco, purchased at Prairie Lights, was well tumbled before I crossed the threshold at City Lights, farther from my na native Midwest than I'd ever been before. As I grew my own publishing career here, I ransacked Bay Area bookshops, loading my library with art and esoterica inaccessible during my younger days. Through zinedom, I was in touch with an ever-growing number of lesser-known writers and artists, enjoying how their pamphlets brought a personal angle to topics I'd thought of as purely academic. I even began shelving books I'd written or published myself. And as the idealistic armor of my youth grew dented by blows from adulthood's harsh realities, a small but significant region of my bookcase was given over to introspective psychology and self-help titles. I'd kept many favorite books from childhood, too, and stepping back from the now groaning bookcases that comprised my library, I could see, in a sense, my inner life's history manifest before me. Books of fiction and fact had taken me many places, and the library was my gazetteer, the patchwork atlas of my soul. The next one I'm going to share was one that was published by Wonderella, and um, I'm not sure if they're still officially using that title or if they've shifted over to officially be Peculiar Parish, the publishers, um, but it's, you know, the it's still Clint Marsh, it's still the creators of um, Fiddler's Green and all that who are ultimately publishing this. Um, and this one is the first little pamphlet, I think, that I ever got that was associated with Fiddler's Green in any way. And it's titled On Gnoming by Reginald Bakley. And this is a, as it says here, a pocket guide to the successful hunting and cooking of gnomes, revised and updated. Um, it is just a very handy little DIY workbook, I suppose you would say, about um, advice for when you're going out and hunting gnomes and um, things to be aware of and generally how to do it respectfully. Um, there's also inf uh, even some information about cooking gnomes and um, different methods for it. So it's a very helpful and interesting little zine. I'm very glad I picked it up. And of course, it piqued my interest to see if they would have any other works. Not everything that they produce is as practical as this one, but it's still a lovely little thing to have in my collection. I will read one little piece here that um, might help you on your gnoming journey, but of course I recommend picking up the whole thing if you can. Gnomes have an olfactory sense nearly as sharp as their joining skill, so the successful gnomer will take care to smear his skin and clothing with generous amounts of les odeurs de la forêt, as the French would have it. That means, um, sense of the forest. <laughs> Mix elderberries, broken up toadstools, and stag droppings to make a thick paste, rubbing it on yourself and any weapons you have brought. This will optimize your chance of evading the gnome's keen nostrils. When day and night are at their in-betweenest, that is when you, the wisest gnomer of the wood, smeared in elderberry paste and sling at the ready, will observe the telltale sign of the gnome as he saunters down his forest path. That sign is none other than the gnome's conical red hat. Each gnome wears this distinctive headgear in all periods of wakefulness and sleep. It is that selfsame cap that will prove to be our antagonist's undoing, for it shines like a crimson beacon atop his head. And of course, when I found out that the creator of that booklet also wrote an extended guidebook titled Goblin Proofing One's Chicken Coop uh, and Other Practical Advice in Our Campaign Against the Fairy Kingdom, of course, I had to pick that one up 
This I don't think is actually published by uh, Wonderella, but it's close enough, right? <laughs> it's the same author. I, I would say it's related, so I wanted to show it off here, even though it's not exactly a zine, and it's not exactly a Fiddler's Green thing. <laughs> but, you know, how can I not? Just check it out. This also should be easier for you to uh, pick up, should you be interested in any of this writing. This book has many little guides. First Principles of Fairy, Goblin Proofing One's Chicken Coop, A Groundkeeper's Guide to Dwarves, The Second Sight Smallholder, A Few Words About Flower Fairies, The Abuses of Enchantment, First Aid for the Fairy Shot on Gnoming, um, the booklet that I just showed off, An Iron Nail in Your Pocket, Fairy Foraging, The Uncanny Companion, and additional resources. This one I'm not going to read anything from since we already read a bit from On Gnoming, and I think that you get the idea of the uh, style of the writing, but it's... I, I still highly recommend it. I love every single one here, and it's just full of very helpful tips. So, Goblin Proofing One's Chicken Coop is definitely a little, <laughs> a little book that I'm happy to have in my collection. The next one I want to show off is Enchantment Dismantled, and I don't know which um, issue this was originally printed in, but it was originally printed in one of the uh, Peculiar Parish magazines, an issue that I don't happen to have, unfortunately. Um, but I really enjoy this. The subtitle is Superstition and the Thinking Irrationalist. And it talks about um, superstitions and um, how it's not just those with a magical mindset, as they call it, who are prone to superstition, but um, people in general. And it uh, talks about how to address it, but also how to embrace it in some ways. Uh, the portion I'm going to read is one little bit from the back here. Breaking the spell of our useless superstitions and embracing the magic of healthy ones may seem like a lot of work. Why not just jettison superstition altogether? Simply put, we can't. Our superstitions compose an essential part of the greatest enchantment of all, the one which wraps our souls up in this material world, so full of mystery and wonder. For all the trouble they cause, they also fuel our burning desire to discover the truths of this world, and we wouldn't be human without them. So this is, of course, another very lovely little uh, leaflet. <laughs> this is my second issue of Fiddler's Green. It is the Woodcutter's Moon issue, which is volume two, issue two. I think that is number six or seven. I can't remember exactly. Um, and this one, of course, is lovely. I believe this one is from 2019. Yes, 2019. Um, and it, this one is very interesting. It has a lot more um, practical issues or, or, or practical articles than some of the other ones have, which is very interesting. It has a lot more art. Um, they have a whole art gallery called the Compendium, Compendium of Witches. The one that I want to share here is a little poem and illustration by Kelly Patton um, that is just absolutely beautiful. I should photocopy this and put it on my wall or something because I just, I really love looking at it. Um, this is a verse from the poem. Little black cat leaps into the air, turning into long black hair. Little black cat no longer small, a slender form standing tall. And I'll read one other stanza from it that I just like very much. Or one other verse, I suppose. Little black cat with gold green eyes, she will take you by surprise. Little black cat with a star on her chest becomes a witch upon request. So we're almost to the end here. I do have the latest issue of Fiddler's Green on the way, which um, was released several months ago, but I've just not been very good about keeping it up, though I want I want to be better about it because I really do enjoy reading and and collecting Fiddler's Green. Um, but the for now, the last one that I have to show off is my favorite, Armchair Demonology, The Magical Benefits of Cultivating Bad Habits, which is another beautiful leaflet. Again, I'm not sure which one it's from. Um, and it basically... It talks about the um, the ritual of the author smoking pipe tobacco and drinking tea that's been hand brewed, and it's just um, very very beautiful. And um, 
I guess, talks about ritual in a way that before I read this, I was never invested in. I was never interested in. I didn't care about ritual of any kind. And I'm still a little, you know, it's not my, my natural setting, I suppose, to create rituals out of something. But this was really eye-opening. And I'll just read the uh, opening paragraph here. So many philosophies of magic promise great insight and results through sober asceticism or through ordeals of excess, but in my own experience I've found that, under the right circumstances, a proper magical mindset is achievable through the simple pleasures to be found in teacup and pipe. So, <laughs> I do, I do very, I do very much love this one. I think this will be always and forever my favorite Fiddler's Green, um, publication. <laughs> Thank you very much for joining me on this little tour. Uh, Fiddler's Green will always have a very soft place in my heart, and I um, hope that you enjoyed seeing my little collection of some of their publications. Um, and if you are feeling inspired to pick any up, of course I will have links and further description for everything in the box below. Um, besides that, I will See you next week for another zine share. Bye.